Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session. Uh, my colleague Yifan and I are excited to talk about accelerating machine learning on Databricks runtime. Uh, Yifan is a product manager on machine learning at Databricks, and I am a software engineer um, uh, in our machine learning team. So uh, we are excited to talk about the, the latest uh, work we have done to accelerate machine learning on our platform. Here's the outline of the talk. I will first introduce the Databricks runtime for machine learning, and you'll hear me call it uh, ML runtime, a runtime for ML, or MLR. They're all the same things. And then uh, Yifan will uh, introduce some real-world uh, examples of using uh, the ML runtime. We found that to be very popular with Spark Summit audiences in the past. They like to know how other companies are using uh, different Spark-related technologies. Uh, then I will um, go under the hood and show you how uh, we built the ML runtime and what uh, developer uh, tools and technologies we use to deliver this. And then uh, there'll be a quick demo, just uh, high-level features. And finally, we'll talk about our roadmap and what's coming next. OK, so um, to, to get started, um, the background of the project is that we have been observing uh, very broad uh, interest and adoption of machine learning among our customers and you know, Spark and big data users in general. Uh, machine learning is disrupting uh, many industries ranging from you know, genomics and healthcare all the way to uh, you know, fintech and, uh, and finance and everything in between. And when uh, a customer starts their machine learning journey, um, very uh, soon they realize uh, what we uh, like to refer as hidden tech debt we actually borrowed it from this uh, paper published by uh, Google in 2015. The title was Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems. The idea is that um, when you have, when you look at a working end-to-end -end, uh, ML uh, project, the, what people refer to as machine learning or the actual machine learning and algorithm co code en ends up being a tiny fraction of the whole system or the whole uh, like, uh, technology. And that's represented by that small box in the middle. Um, there, there needs to be a lot of other components and systems in place in order for that uh, small bit of ML to be effective and actually work. And with the unified analytics platform, we try to provide the whole uh, system, the end-to-end -end infrastructure that uh, our customers need in order to be successful with machine learning. So at the lowest layer, we have the Databricks Cloud Service. This is the, the system that interfaces with the, you know, the various cloud providers and acquires resources and puts them together and configures them and basically gives the, uh, the, the user a, 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 like a cluster that is ready to be used. And inside that cluster is the runtime that is you know, the, the Spark engine and all the other uh, libraries and frameworks that go with it and that's where the user code is executed. So the application is actually is running inside the runtime. And finally, at the top, we have um, the collaborative workspace that includes notebooks and jobs where data scientists and data engineers work together to explore, and, uh, you know, explore the data, you know, build the pipelines, and just productionize it. And all of it is within a single, uh, what we call unified framework, and that's how we can uh, secure the whole thing and offer enterprise features like you know, access control or uh, uh, you know, encryption at rest and all the other things that your IT department probably wants you to uh, uh, satisfy before they allow you to use any external service. So in this talk, we're going to focus in the middle layer uh, and talk about the, in the recent innovations we've done to um, enable machine learning in our runtime. So let's start with the requirements. Uh, when we talk to machine learning practitioners and ask them what are your requirements uh, for an effective uh, environment to work in, uh, they, they come up with two high-level ones. First is that they want to be able to quickly start with their actual machine learning or their actual project. And, and, you know, they say today I have to spend hours and sometimes days setting up the environment, like installing different libraries and configuring them and having them like talk to each other and whatnot. So they want it to be 
um, uh, easy to, and fast to start. Second, they don't want to have to move their data and their code around from one system to another in order to do their job. They want a single place to do everything. So um, especially there are multiple steps uh, for each machine learning project, and they want to be able to do all those steps in a single, uh, in a single environment. At a very high level, you know, from 10,000 feet, those three steps are data preparation, where you, you know, load your unstructured you know, text data, you, you know, load data from various sources, different databases, um, and then put them together and give them schema and structure. And then you, you do feature engineering, which is a critical uh, part of any successful model. And the next step is where, the, quote unquote, the fun part begins, where you try out different algorithms and models and tune them and optimize them. And finally, you want to productionize it, because your model is only as good as the value it gives to your customers or your, your clients. We have built the Databricks Runtime for ML to be a single environment for all these three steps. So what is it? Um, the Databricks Runtime for Machine Learning is a ready-to-use environment for machine learning and data, uh, for, uh, machine learning and data scientists. Um, it includes many of the popular ML frameworks. Uh, you see the logos of some of them here. And the whole thing is built on top of the Databricks Runtime. So it gets... Uh, all the improvements and every release of the database runtime uh, will go into the database runtime for ML. We have included APIs for distributed deep learning uh, using Spark. Uh, this is called Horovod Runner. And there are also some additional performance improvements for some of the popular uh, distributed algorithms <clears throat> in Spark. To give it a more concrete picture, uh, if you're familiar with the Databricks cluster, uh, cluster UI, when you go to create a cluster, you can simply pick the, you know, the runtime that has the ML label next to it, and with a, a few clicks, you get a cluster that has the environments uh, set up on every uh, node or instance of your cluster. So it's pretty, uh, pretty easy to set up and get going with. Uh, I'll, in my demo, I'll show um, how this actually works. So now, let's talk about the three steps, and I'll tell you how the runtime for ML can be, can be used for those. As I mentioned, the first step is usually data preparation, and that includes uh, like things like ETL all the way to feature engineering. What I would like to highlight is because the database runtime for ML is part of the unified analytics platform, all of the existing features that you expect from the, the framework or the, the platform, you can use in conjunction with the uh, ML runtime. So basically, you can use the notebooks to easily access, explore, visualize your data. You can use any of the languages you are, uh, you're, you're used to or you're familiar uh, with, like you know, Scala, Python, R, or SQL. And you know, the, the optimized Apache Spark engine that you expect uh, from Databricks is running under the hood. You, know, you can use structured streaming. Delta Lake, which was just announced this morning, is ready to be used on the ML runtime. And there's the, the Hive Metastore and everything else that you expect from the uh, database is usable on the machine learning runtime. And when you have a notebook that you want to automate as a job, you can uh, ask your jo our job scheduler to use the ML runtime for, uh, for your cluster. So again, any feature you expect from database during the data preparation, you can use uh, with ML runtime. Then the next step is where the actual uh, you know, uh, machine learning uh, work uh, happens. You know, some people. Uh, like this step the most, and that's where they pick an algorithm and then they, they train their models. The reality is today there is no single framework or library that captures all of the use cases. There is a, a, a kind of a, a zoo of various packages and frameworks that cover all the use cases. And what we have done, we have uh, picked the most popular and the most prominent ones and put them together uh, in a single environment on the ML runtime. Here is the list, TensorFlow and TensorBoard, PyTorch, <clears throat> Keras, Horvat for distributed deep learning. In my demo, I'll show you how you can use um, uh, Horvat uh, uh, along with Spark. XGBoost, GraphFrames, which is a Spark package, and uh, some of the other popular single node uh, libraries in Python and R. And I would like to highlight that if you need a library that is not included in ML runtime, you can always use the, uh, the library management UI or API to install third-party libraries on all the workers or in instances. And finally, when you want to productionize your, your, the, the model, 
we have MLflow, and same way you would use MLflow anywhere else in database. You can use it on ML runtime. The MLflow's model deployment API is a convenient way of shipping your model to you know, uh, uh, where you want to host it. it is, uh, that could be a Docker container that you're running on-prem. It could be Azure ML if you're using Azure, or SageMaker if you're using AWS. In addition, we have included MLEAP, which is a, a very popular model serialization library in um, database runtime for ML. So you can use that to basically persist your models on, on distributed storage and then pick it up from another system to use it. So basically, that shows how you can use uh, the single runtime, launch a cluster, and then use it for all the three steps of the, the workflow. So now let's go to some uh, real world examples. All right, thank you, Kulsain. One thing I really love my, my job is the ability to work with uh, enterprises from all verticals to help them figure out how they can apply machine learning to create value for their business. Really, I'm, I'm always amazed and excited each time we're able to help these customers turn AI from a buzzword into a critical part of the business. So today I will show you three real world examples where uh, we work with these customers uh, to allow them to uh, get to value using machine learning. Uh, first example is Hotels.com. It is uh, Hotels.com is in the business of matching travelers with the right hotels. Their big challenge, they have a big data and a machine learning challenge there. They have about 325,000 hotels listed worldwide. And then they also realize the conversion rate of a traveler's um, on their platform has a lot to do with the kind of images the traveler will see um, when they, based on their criteria. So they want to build a machine learning model that match based the traveler criteria and the image provide a personalized uh, displaying pro uh, experience for the user to increase the conversion rate. So this is a big data problem. You can imagine there have 300,000 hotels. Each of the hotels self-generated tons of images data. How to train these data, how to classify these data, how to apply object detection at scale becomes a large problem. And so th they leverage uh, Databricks. They leverage uh, what Hossein said earlier, Horvath Runner, which is a, a way to uh, use distributed deep learning framework called Horvath uh, to be able to train 100% of their images in Databricks. In addition, they like the fact that in cre cluster creation time, you can immediately create an environment with popular deep learning frameworks such as TensorFlow, such as PyTorch pre-installed, so that their data sciences, deep learning specialists, can get started developing models just within a matter of minutes. Uh, because of that, they were able to increase their processing time by 20x and enable real-time scoring. As a result, Hotels.com was able to significantly improve their customer engagement and con conversion rate by displaying the right set of images in front of the audience when they are looking for hotels on their website. We published a study on our, site, our website. Uh, if you're interested, definitely take a look at it. The next example is a natural language processing example. We work with a gaming company called Riot Games. Uh, maybe it's more known for uh, the maker of League of Legends. And their problem is they have about more than 100 million gamers every month. And then in their study, they found out that uh, one of the biggest issues for their gaming experience, in-game experience, is um, there's abusive language in their, in their messaging or chat, or chat rooms. In fact, about 2% of other games are impacted by such issue. So then they, were, then they were thinking to themselves, how can I leverage Databricks to build a model to detect these, these abusive language, especially in real time, and to then take preventive actions? Thus, they will provide a better experience to their customers and increase the lifetime value of these gamers. So they work in Databricks to um, build a pipeline that can um, go through multiple stages of a typical NLP problem. So you, uh, they can pre-process their text files, then they apply different uh, deep learning algorithm to extract the embeddings from these texts, and finally they apply machine learning algorithm to classify uh, these texts into certain criteria, uh, or certain classes. And then using Databricks, they were able to train on a much larger data sets, and more importantly, they're also able to 
um, speed up their hyperparameter tuning process so then they can find the right optimal neural network that gives them the best model results. Uh, because of that, they are able to uh, develop a, a model that detects these toxic languages in real time and take preventive actions and thus increase their customer satisfaction. We also publish study on our website. Last not but not least is a company called Nielsen. It's a company that made its, makes uh, money based on selling insights to data. So, so they're uh, especially around what consumer buy and what consumers watch. There's, as you can imagine, Nielsen over time, as especially in the last five or 10 years, the amount of data they will collect and use this data to extract insight into what people buy and watch increase significantly, especially there's a lot of devices where they can collect such data, IoT devices in particular. So their challenge is how can they move from a single node machine data science to uh, train on a much larger data sets and then thus improve their competitive offerings. Uh, Databricks uh, ML runtime provides the ability for their team to collaborate across uh, multiple teams. As you can imagine, to understand insights into data, you need some help from the data engineering team, data science team, even the business user with the domain experience, expertise all collaborate in a single notebook and to be able to build out the best, uh, uh, the best product. So they were able to leverage the collaborative nature of a, of a Databricks uh, notebooks and they were able to uh, use that Databricks to train on a much larger data sets. Over time, they were able to improve the model performance by uh, a third and increase their overall cost by uh, 40%. So Databricks improved their uh, Nielsen's competitor offerings by uh, allowing them to apply ML uh, uh, from both batch and streaming data uh, from IoT devices. Uh, so those are three real world examples where customers are using Databricks um, uh, to uh, really achieve values from their uh, machine learning and data science. So next, I'll hand over to Hossein to talk about some of the uh, technical details. All right, thank you, Yifan. Um, <clears throat> this is where the engineers in the room are gonna uh, uh, see how we basically make the sausage. Um, when we started the project, uh, we had very specific engineering goals to deliver the, this new runtime. The, the top uh, and most important one was uh, ability to produce an, a reproducible environment. Basically, we want to have absolute control over uh, what packages and what dependencies go into the runtime. Um, test, testability and testing was a, was a big uh, uh, you know, requirement. We need to kind of uh, assure we deliver a working set of packages with the right quality to the customers. I'll talk about how we test and what, our, what is our infrastructure and what process we have in place. Cross compatibility uh, was because we, we are installing various packages from different sources. We need to make sure they, first of all, work together. Some of them have common and shared dependencies, and in some cases, we need to uh, be, be extra careful making sure we right, install the right dependencies and configure them uh, the right way. And finally, we use uh, the ML runtime to, as, as a delivery vehicle for some of the performance optimizations um, that we do uh, for machine learning use cases. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about uh, some of uh, our efforts around high performance uh, IO. So if you look at it, these are all the things that the data scientist does not want to do. So as engineers, we do them and automate them uh, so that they don't have to worry about. Let's talk about package management. We use Conda for Python package management on the database runtime for ML. This is actually something new uh, in the existing, uh, basically in, you know, standard database runtimes, we're using pip. We instantiate two environments on each uh, cluster. There's a Python 2 and a Python 3 environment uh, with the same packages. And when you launch a cluster, you pick which environment you want to use because you pick the version of Python, and then you'll, you'll basically be using that environment. And for the packages, we pick the latest stable versions of the libraries from Anaconda distribution. So to compare, Python package management and the Python environment between ML runtime and the standard Databricks runtime, um, the first distinction is you'll, you'll find more up-to-date packages on ML runtime, and that's because, as I mentioned, we picked the latest stable from Anaconda. With Databricks standard runtime, we, 
we are very careful about backwards compatibility, so we haven't updated the, the Python packages. Next, as I mentioned, uh, we're using Conda versus pip. So um, on the standard runtime, you'll find the packages that have been uh, installed from, uh, from PyPy, whereas uh, you know, we use Anaconda or other Conda channels on ML runtime, so there might be a slight difference in terms of like, the contents of the package. And finally, you know, the ML libraries that uh, you know, are available in ML runtime aren't necessarily installed in standard runtime, so there's an extra set of packages in ML runtime. Um, one other thing to note is the accelerators. ML runtime includes MKL for CPU acceleration and CUDA and CUDNN for GPU acceleration when you're using GPU instances. So, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the packages like TensorFlow or uh, NumPy on a CPU instance will be accelerated with MKL. Okay, so that's just Python, and uh, because a lot of the frameworks are Python packages, I spend extra time uh, talking about it. But it's not just Python. We have a whole lot of other packages that are installed in ML runtime. We've published blog posts to uh, explain how we use Bazel for our build system. Um, so that's the high-level bullet because all of this package management is tied together using uh, our Bazel build system. As I mentioned, Conda is used for Python. We install jars using Maven. For R, it's a little bit more tricky because it's harder to uh, control exactly what version of an R package you're getting and what dependency is coming. Um, we, our solution is using nightly CRAN snapshots that Microsoft publishes, and they call it MRAN, so we use that. And for native packages, we use uh, Ubuntu's APT system and Docker containers to control exactly what goes inside the runtime. So um, internally, every Databricks runtime is built using Docker. It has... Um, great uh, features for us that, you know, there's a reason we use it. It gives us full control over uh, the content, like down to the uh, specific file that we want to include in the runtime, and it is uh, reproducible, and we can automate it with libraries, like we can automate it uh, with, our, with, with APIs. For ML runtime, the, uh, the interesting architectural um, decision is that it is just a Docker layer on top of DBR. So that has a couple advantages. First, ML runtime benefits from all of the existing DBR tests and QA process. So um, that includes, let's say, the latest imp uh, performance improvements on DBR will be available in MLR. And second, every hotfix and every release and every patch that we uh, work on for DBR will automatically be shipped to MLR. So that's how we use Docker and what it gives us uh, uh, in terms of packaging MLR. Next, let's talk about testing. This is where we spend significant amount of our time to, uh, to give a high quality collection of packages to our customers. We have written extensive tests for top tier packages in our runtime. And uh, we have a fairly rigorous testing process. Every commit runs all unit and integration tests. And on top of that, we have nightly tests against master and uh, all the release branches. We also use um, all CPU and GPU instances on both Azure and AWS. So we have a fairly complete te te uh, testing matrix uh, to guarantee that these packages can be used in various environments. To give you an insight uh, into our integration tests, uh, we have two categories of those. There are some smaller integration tests where we launch a Docker container and then run commands uh, inside the Docker container to verify we get the, 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 the required result. And then you have a set of larger tests where we actually launch a full cluster with you know, a master and workers, and then execute a notebook on that cluster and verify that we get the result that uh, we should. And finally, um, I want to talk about uh, uh, our work around high performance Fuse. How many people here are familiar with uh, Fuse file systems? Raise your hand if you know what they are. Okay. There are probably uh, 10 people at most. So I'm going to tell you why it's, uh, it's useful uh, uh, for machine learning use cases. Think about the three steps of the machine learning pipeline we talked about, data preparation and then model building. During the data preparation, you obviously want to use Apache Spark. It's a great tool for ETL. It's a great tool for feature engineering. Spark can handle large data and can store them on distributed storage. Then you want to build your model, and imagine you want to use uh, some Python library, let's say scikit-learn, uh, 
that doesn't really know how to talk to distributed storage. Now, um, imagine you want to run that on every worker of your cluster. So let's say you have a 10-node cluster. You want to run a you know, train the scikit learn model on each worker. So how are we going to load the data into each worker? The solution is using a Fuse client or a, a user space file system uh, client. Um, so you store your data at the end of your, your Spark pipeline into your uh, distributed file system, let's say uh, S3. And then on each of the workers, you read them from a special mount point and um, your library doesn't realize it's reading from the, the distributed storage. It's, it, it's as if it's loading it from local disk. So that's why it's very useful for the machine learning use cases. Um, when you do that, you want to make sure uh, you're not I.O. bound. So, like, so consider you have a GPU accelerated TensorFlow you know, uh, training uh, uh, application. You definitely don't want that to be sitting idle waiting for data to be loaded into memory. That's why we have, uh, uh, we have put some effort into uh, making uh, sure we have Azure storage views uh, and uh, uh, Goofies available on Azure and AWS. In fact, uh, the uh, creator of Goofies is sitting in the audience. Kahing is here. You can ask him about, uh, about what it is, but it's basically a, a high-throughput Fuse client uh, for S3. And the mount points are pre-configured on the ML runtime uh, at DBFS ML and the latest uh, version of ML runtime. Okay, so I'm going to give you a very quick demo so that what we talked about uh, becomes much more uh, concrete. So I'm going to switch to the DataRicks notebook. Does everyone in the back see the text? Okay. As the first step, I want to show you how easy it is to, to launch a cluster. So I'm going to create uh, a cluster called MLR. All I do, I click on the drop-down menu and choose whether I want GPU or, or, or non-GPU version of uh, ML runtime. If I choose the GPU version, it tells me that I need to pick a GPU instance type. And if I choose CPU, um, then um, I don't need to pick a, um, uh, an, a, a GPU instance type. A regular instance type would work. I can choose the version of Python. This is where the environment is selected for me. Let's stick with Python 3. I can enable auto-scaling, so I can have workers come uh, get added to my cluster as my, uh, my workload uh, increases. And then they would be removed and given back to the cloud uh, provider so to save costs. And I also enable auto-termination. Uh, auto that means if my cluster is not used for, let's say, 15 minutes, it's going to be terminated by the cluster manager, so I don't, I don't pay for it. And I just click this button and start creating my cluster. Since I don't want to keep you waiting, I've already created some clusters, and I want to show you two examples. The first example is, let me zoom in. The first example is using a single node Keras uh, in a single node cluster. So here I have a, uh, a cluster that um, is just one master node, and I, I don't need any workers because I'm going to be doing single node. I don't need to pay for extra workers. So what I do, I just uh, import the, the libraries that I need, and you know, note that I don't need to install anything. They're already installed for me. And after they're imported, I am going to actually let me clear the results from the last run. So let's run this again. This is, uh, we're going to use the very popular MNIST data set. This is detecting handwritten digits. And I'm going to go through this uh, notebook fairly quickly just to show you uh, how easy it is to use it. Obviously, when you use a, a, you know, a, a more sophisticated example, there's more, uh, more steps involved. So I'm just loading um, data from uh, the, the, the Python package. I don't need to download them, or I don't need to read them from, uh, from, a, from file system. And I just split them to training and testing. And then I'm here specifying a directory for my uh, TensorBoard logs. And then start TensorBoard, because I want to be monitoring the performance of my model. Next, I define a very simple 2D, uh, two-layer model, and just uh, train that model on the very small data set that I have. 
and uh, it's basically running it and, and training, the, the, you know, training the model parameters. And at the end, I just want to uh, you know, do a very naive uh, evaluation on the performance. So as it's training, it is producing logs and putting them in a directory that I uh, have already configured. So I can click on this link and see the TensorBoard UI and monitor the performance of my model. And for those in the audience who've already used TensorBoard, they know how um, useful it is for uh, model diagnostics. OK, so I don't want to go into any more details. That's basically just to show you how easy it is to use all these tools together uh, you know, in a notebook. Next, I want to give you a, a quick uh, demo for, um, let me clear the results, for how we can distribute uh, deep learning uh, with um, Horovod on Spark. Here I'm using another cluster. This cluster has two workers because I want to actually run distributed jobs. And I will use a um, checkpointing directory. Here I'm using the, the Fuse client. And then this time I'm using PyTorch. Again, importing just works because uh, I don't, you know, it's already installed for me. And I define a very simple network. Again, similar architecture and similar data set but this time with PyTorch instead of Keras and TensorFlow. Now, I define a function that just trained one batch of data and uh, prepare the logging directory. And then this is another function that, that can save uh, my checkpoint. And finally, it's the this train is the main function that ties them together and builds the, the training model. I can call train on my driver node, but that is only running uh, you know, on a single node. It's not distributed. Now, you know, it's just going through them and like running them, uh, you know, training the, the parameters. Now, I want to show you how this can be par uh, paralyzed with Horovod. Um, we have uh, implemented a library called Horovod Runner, and we distribute it as part of Spark Deep Learning, and Spark Deep Learning package is included in ML runtime. So all you need to do is import Horovod.torch, um, and then import Horvath Runner from Spark Deep Learning. Again, I don't need to worry about installing the right version of these things that work with each other. I just import them and start using them. Uh, then I take my train function and modify a few places in that to uh, take advantage of Horvath's API for telling each of the workers which uh, section of the data to load f using, uh, from the Fuse client, and uh, which section of the parameters to train on, and like how to distribute the work. So it's, I have control over how I, I want to uh, distribute training on the workers. I'm not going to go into more details. We have um, done webinars on this. If you're interested how this works under the hood, go to Shang Ri's talk on uh, the pro project Hyd uh, Hydrogen and uh, uh, look up uh, on our documentation for much more extensive introduction to Horvath Runner. And finally, I just call horvath.run on my function and uh, tell it that I have two workers, and it will basically launch a Spark job and uh, you know, I'll you know, run a Python process on each worker that talks to the GPUs and you know, runs PyTorch on that worker. And that's it. Then I can like, you know, take my model and like ship it for production. Okay, before we run out of time, we want to talk about the future. All right, I'll quickly go through uh, some of our future work. Um, we released uh, Databricks Runtime for ML around last June, so it's been about 10 months since we uh, initially released it. We decided to call that, made that generally available about a month ago because we've seen the usage growth have uh, grown significantly. We have close to a thousand different organizations and customers tried it out, receive a ton of good feedback from them, which we use to continue to add to our test suite to make our uh, environment stable. Um, uh, so we decided to call that, uh, made that generally available. Um, in Databricks, uh, in the Runtime 6.0, which is back to get released uh, second half this year, uh, a major initiative we're working on is how to make our ML environment 
uh, how to improve that ML environment experience better. Uh, as many of users like the, pre, the fact that the environment can pre-install with certain packages, we also have certain uh, users that want to customize that environment exactly down to um, the, the library or the versions they want. Uh, that's a big focus we are, uh, we are working on is to be able to allow that, them to easily customize that environment and even be able to share that environment across different team members um, to reproduce the results. Um, so in 6.0, our goal really is to unify all this in a single runtime. We're also considering removing the Python 2.x. So I can give you a little bit of sneak peek of what, uh, what our current vision is. Uh, as Hossein was showing you earlier, there is long drop-down list as when you're creating a cluster. Um, and then as the number of libraries we tend to will support or pre-install grow in the futures, which we do expect, as the number of releases we expect to grow uh, longer, that drop-down list will, will no longer become very user-friendly. So our vision for 6.0 is to be able to unify into a single one, where you first pick the, uh, the, the data which runtime version, and then you pick a couple pre-configured environment for you. Uh, the standard will be the database runtime. The machine learning will be the machine learning runtime. And then we also introduce the new concept of a minimal environment that has a bare minimal environment that you can pick that, that it's easier for you to customize environment with. So our vision is you can, you can click the minimal environment and then upload a declarative file that specify the libraries and the versions you want and be able to spin up, again, a cluster with the exact right set of the uh, the, the environment that you, you need to get you started. Uh, ML environment is super critical to us because that's how uh, machine learning and data science get started. And that's a big, uh, major focus of, of us. Uh, but that's not the only thing we do. We we'll continue to investigate uh, how to make it easier for our user to use um, the latest and greatest tools out there. For example, how you distribute single node deep learning, how you distribute uh, single node uh, hyperparameter tuning, and this and that. So uh, just want to give you a sneak peek. Um, I think we have about three minutes left. Um, want to op you know, open up the floor for any questions. If you do have a question, please walk to the uh, microphone there. And uh, please uh, download the, the apps from App Store or Google Play and provide your feedback. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, thanks. It was a great talk. Uh, so what if you want to uh, change some packages in this environment? Can you do that and keep it the same way when you want to deploy it into production? So th let me make sure uh, I get the question. Uh, I, I have installed some packages into the runtime, and then I want to deploy uh, uh, my, my model into production. How do I make sure the production environment has the same packages? Is that right? OK. So for that, if you look at the MLflow API, <clears throat> with MLflow, you can declare the dependencies of your project with an environment file. And then so you specify exactly what versions of packages your model was uh, trained on. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, when you publish your model, that env.yaml file will be used to reproduce the environment in the production system. We have time for probably one more question. Yes. Uh, yeah, so is it possible or is it going to be possible in the future to have an option to create a cluster in which the driver node has a GPU and the worker nodes have only CPU? Ah, so the question is, can we have GPU on a driver, but uh, just <coughs> CPUs on the workers? It is possible. The, the UI doesn't expose that, but it can use the API to actually specify uh, CPU instance types for the workers and just you know, the, drive, the master nodes GPU. Um, um, one thing you might you know, watch for is you're using a, a GPU-based runtime on CPU instances, so some of the acceler CPU accelera accelerations might not work. Yes. Thank, thanks for the great talk. One question. How are you planning to compete with AWS SageMaker? Because they are also building up their product. So what's your strategy there? You want to take this? Uh, our, our, our goal to be competitive is really threefold. One is we focus on usability. How can we use, how can we make our users to have a, how can we improve the usability for our data scientists so they can focus on the training aspect? For example, we pre-bake this environment. We make it very easy for you to customize and share this environment. We take certain, li we take certain libraries out there. We make it like, very easy for the use, especially libraries that tend to work very well on a single node, but there isn't a very good way of doing that in a distributed manner, such as Horva, 
such as we're also working on some hyperparameter solutions that's, uh, that's a little more challenging to, uh, to easily distribute over. So that's the first aspect is the usability. The second part is the robustness, right? As a data science, the last thing you want to deal with is when you're installing uh, libraries or upgrading libraries, things breaks. And that's why we're investing a lot to really kind of like continue to add to our test suite, to continue to make our environment stable and robust. The last one, at least, is we're looking for any sort of performance edge we can add to, um, uh, to for you when you're working in, in uh, data runtime time for ML. Um, and especially a lot of the, uh, the, the algorithm that's built, the machine learning algorithm that's built on Spark, ML lib and graphene frames, there is a performance edge there, so which means that you, it's actually faster, it's more scalable compared to the off-the-shop uh, open source algorithm. Thank you. I guess we're out of time. Thank you.